The main differences between extension springs and compression springs is that extension springs are subjected to tensile loading since the end sections need to transfer the load to the body of the spring and that they are usually intentionally manufactured to carry an initial tension. The stresses within the body section of the extension spring are the same as the ones we already studied for compression springs in the last few videos, which are purely shearing stresses. However, the hook ends are subjected to tensile stresses and the maximum tensile stress you'll find will be caused by both bending and axial loading. Regardless of the type of hook, either a sudden transition to a half loop or a twisted loop consisting of two radii, the maximum tensile stress will happen where the moment and the axial load are highest. The largest moment occurs when farthest from the tensile load, which causes a moment of F times D over 2, which turns out to be where the axial stress is largest too, as the load would be perpendicular to the cross-section of the wire at that point. Just like we added a curvature correction factor to the shearing stress of compression springs, the maximum normal stress also needs to be corrected using a bending stress correction factor for curvature Ka, which depends on C1, which in turn is a curvature coefficient unrelated to the spring index capital C and depends on the radius of the hook itself. There will of course be a transition section of the extension spring that will be subjected to both shearing and normal stresses, but the maximum shearing stress you'll find will be the same expression we used for compression springs, with the slight difference that the curvature correction factor we use here is Kb, which confusingly enough does not equal the Berg-Strasser factor we were using then. In this case, Kb depends on C2, and C2 is again not related to the sprint index C, but it's just another curvature factor that depends on the radius of the twisting of the loop. You can imagine that for a sudden transition into the hook for the body of the extension spring, R2 would be very small, and so would C2, and therefore the correction factor would be large, and so would the stress. And this is the reason there is usually a twist before the hook or loop a more gradual transition from the body to the hook. In addition to these differences, namely the addition normal stresses and the different correction factors, like I mentioned at the beginning, extension springs that are made with coils in contact with each other or close wound springs, manufacturers add an initial tension so that when the spring is stretched, the force does not begin at zero. If there was not an initial tension, then the force would be exactly zero as you start pulling on the spring and linearly increase as you keep pulling. Ideally, you want the spring to already generate a reaction force as soon as the spring starts stretching. Now, how would you do this if the coils are already touching? You could not just compress it past the initial length so that at its initial length, there's already tension there. Remember how I explained that under compression, a compression spring only creates shearing stresses inside of it? Well, the principle is the same one here. To create a tension, which is the opposite of compression, you can literally just twist the wire to create the torsional shearing stresses you would get from compression and manufacture the spring with coils touching with one another. Even though the coils would not be able to physically overlap, the twisting of the wire, which causes torsional stresses, will in fact try to make the coils want to compress even further. For this reason, the load versus deflection relationship is not just Ky, but Ky plus that initial tension at a zero deflection. Just like the compression stresses in either extension or compression springs, the spring constant K is calculated with the same expression we derived during the first spring video, link below. The free length would be the length from the inside part of one loop or hook to the other, as these are the locations of whatever is causing the load. The part that is stretching the spring would be in contact with the loop at that location. The expression would be the length of the body of the spring plus two loops using the inner diameter, again because that is where the spring would make contact with the load. The length of the body, as you can see from this expression, is the number of body coils plus one times the diameter of the wire, just like we usually did for the solid length of compression springs, link below. This expression is usually simplified using the spring index C, again not related to the curvature coefficients C1 and C2, by factoring out a lowercase d from the second term. With the twisted end loops, which is a very common spring geometry, the active coils variable Na, which you would still use to calculate the spring constant K, would be equivalent to the number of body coils plus the ratio between G and E, the shear and elastic modulus respectively. At this point, we have everything we need to calculate the spring constant K, the stresses, both tensile and shearing, and we're only missing how to calculate the initial tension Fi. 
Just to reiterate, this initial tension is caused by twisting the wire as it is wound onto the mandrel. As soon as you bring the spring out of the mandrel, it will have this initial tension locked since the spring cannot get any shorter. The recommended range for the initial torsional stress is given by an expression that depends on the spring index C. And this is the expression you would compare to the uncorrected stress, meaning without the curvature correction factor Kb. This expression is used to check if the initial tension force Fi that I'd like my spring to have is creating a shearing stress tau i, again uncorrected, within the range given by the expression. Finally, the percentage for yield strengths are different for shearing and compression springs than for torsion and bending and extension springs. So you'll find different percentage numbers for SSY, the shearing yield strength we've been using so far, than for tension yield strength of helical extension springs and for torsion yield strength of helical extension springs, if you look them up online. Let's look at an example where we make use of everything we've learned today. Using a wire diameter of 42 thousandths of an inch, of hard drawn steel wire and an outside coil diameter of 0.265 inches with hook radii of 0.1 and 0.08 inches, I'd like to know if it can be used for a 6 pound static load if the spring is manufactured with an initial tension of 1.5 pounds and I count 12.5 body turns. Of course, what I mean by I'd like to know if it can be used is calculating the factor of safety and calculating the spring length when extended to see if it fits in a specific application location. So let's start there with the length when extended. I know that the length will be the free length plus the deflection when it's subjected to a six pound force. The free length will depend on the spring index C, the number of body turns and the wire diameter. And the maximum deflection will depend on the forces and the spring constant. For the spring index, I will need the mean coil diameter capital D, which can be found with the outer diameter information I got at the beginning. Using the spring index, the 12.5 body turns and the wire diameter, I find that my free length is 0.93 inches. For the maximum deflection, the spring rate can be found if I know the number of active coils. By looking up the properties that we've looked before for shear modulus and elastic modulus, I find that there's 12.9 active coils. With that information and the diameters, the spring constant is 31.54 pounds per inch. And with the spring constant, I find that the maximum deflection is 0.1427 inches, which when added to the free length allows me to find the length when the spring is extended. Now for the factor of safety, I need to check for three stresses and three yielding properties. The first one will be the factor of safety for the bending at the end hook, which will compare the tension yield strength of a helical extension spring to the normal stress due to bending. The second one will be the factor of safety for the torsion at the end hook, which will compare the torsion yield strength or maximum allowable strength as a function of SUT and the shearing stresses due to torsion at the end hook. And finally, I would still look for the factor of safety for the shearing stresses inside the body of the spring, which is what we've also been doing for compression springs. Since all of the yield strengths are a fraction of the tensile strength, SUT, I also need to calculate that. For hard drawn wire, we've looked up these coefficients several times. The shearing yield strength we've also used several times for a spring without a preset or before set removed, and that's 45%. For the torsion yield strength for the stress at the hook, we find that it is equal to 40% the tensile strength, which results in a maximum allowable shearing stress of 102.3 KSI. And for the tensile yield strength, I find a 75% of the tensile strength, which results in 191.8 KSI. For the bending stress at the end hook, we need the correction factor Ka, and for that, the curvature coefficient C1. With a given hook radius R1 of 0.1 inches, I can find C1 and Ka, and therefore the bending stress. The first factor of safety would be 1.692. For the shearing stress at the end hook, I will need the correction factor Kb, which depends on C2, which in turn depends on the hook radius R2. With that hook radius of 0.08 inches, I find C2, Kb, and tau b, and with tau b, the factor of safety for the shearing stress at the hook end. Finally, for the maximum shearing stress within the body of the extension spring, which is what we had been doing for the compression springs, the Bergstrasser factor will depend on the spring index, which we calculated before, which results in a similar shearing stress, but a different factor of safety.
Looking at the numbers for the factor of safety, we can report the lower one of them and even state that if the spring fails, it would be at the hook because of the bending stress. If you want to check out other problems, including checking that the initial tension is safe for this problem that we just solved, make sure to check out the links in the description below. With everything we've covered in the last six videos, you are well prepared to understand the basics of stresses and spring constants for any kind of spring. There are, for example, conical springs with constant force for any deflection, instead of linear force that increases with deflection, and helical coil torsion springs, similar to what you would find on those forearm exercising grips. With what we've covered here, understanding the differences should be very straightforward. So in the next video, we will transition to gears and gear systems, starting with basic gear, angular velocity, torque, and number of teeth relationships. Thanks for watching.